who attends the religious services regularly. He tries to follow the commandments of God. He claims that he knows God well. He tries to avoid sin, at least the big ones. He tries not to commit murder or adultery, at least outwardly, and no stealing. He probably washes his hands before he eats, and he says some prayers. That's one of the people. And the other one, she's a harlot. And if I one you like, you're probably going to say, why are you even asking this comparison? There's no way that we could be like the, the sinner woman. We're probably more like the Pharisee. But you know the story and you know who you wish to be like. And we have ways how to get to be like the person we like. Let's look at the context of the parable. When the Pharisee invited Jesus Christ, he saw it as a blessing. He saw it as something that he deserved because he was a Pharisee and a righteous person that having the great teacher come to my house would be a big deal. It would boost my reputation. Everyone would say, oh, wow, if the great teacher spoke at that Pharisee's house, that Pharisee must be very special. The Pharisee was looking at it as something that was self-seeking. This gesture and his relationship with Christ was, was self-seeking. So he was in it for himself. And Jesus Christ looks at this relationship, and he points that out later, that the relationship that we have is not one of give and take. It's pretty much, I'm giving and you are taking. And he will let him understand this. He says, when I came to the house... You didn't give me water to wash my feet. Now, he didn't say, you didn't wash my feet. He says, you didn't even give me water so that I could wash my own feet. You didn't even do the most basic, which was the custom of the time. There's no warm greetings. There's no anointing of my head. And we know the woman, she went above and beyond. She actually got fragrant oil, not anointed the head, but anointed the feet. So... The Pharisee, when he invited Christ, he did nothing from his heart. His relationship was one of very little love. It was mainly basically one of outward motions so that he could benefit and feel his own righteousness. Christ says, in the relationship that I have with the Pharisee, I'm offering you something, but you're offering nothing in return. Remember, of the two people, we said we might be more like the Pharisee than the other woman. Then comes this intruder. She breaks in, this unwanted guest. Unwanted by who? Who didn't want her there? The Pharisee. Christ, I'm sure, knew that she was coming. The one who knows all things, he knew her. He knew exactly what she was going to do. She had a reputation in the city. Everyone in the city knew exactly who she was and what manner of this woman was from the outside. She was definitely, according to their standards, unworthy to be in the house and even way more unworthy for this sinner woman to touch the feet of the Holy One. Could you imagine the harlot touching the feet of Jesus Christ if he was a prophet for sure? If he knew what manner of this woman it was, there was no way he would let her come near him. That was the custom at the time. Well, the person who was unworthy to be in the house was the one who, you know her actions. She stood behind Christ. She knelt at his feet. She washed them with her tears and her hair. And she anointed the feet with a fragrant oil. So the one who was unworthy did these amazing things. And a lot of the time, we say, based on some of the other stories of women who washed Christ's feet, a lot of time the people around would say, this was wasteful. This was excessive. What she did was too much. I'm going to get back to that. And what did the Pharisee do? The Pharisee did the wagib. Actually, not even the wagib. He didn't even do the basic standards of giving someone water and a warm greeting. So then, 
there are the two people, the one with very little love and the one with great love. And then the Pharisee makes this statement, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this was. What's sad is this. Christ knew exactly what manner of woman she was. The woman herself knew what manner of woman she was. That's why she came. She came to be changed. But what the Pharisee didn't know, that Christ not only knew her, but she also knew what manner of man he was. And that comes out in the parable. And this is the sad part of the whole story, is that he never knew who he was and his relationship to Christ. So then Christ tells the parable and the purpose of the parable. Who is he telling the parable to? He's telling it to the Pharisee, but he's also telling it to the sinner woman. Why the Pharisee? For him to understand who he was. And why the woman? So that she could be justified and praised for what she did. So let's go back and read the parable. He says, let's read it from here. And Jesus answered and said to Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain debtor who had, certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. So, it's very interesting. This is similar to this parable you learned in Matthew 18, when there was a certain man who was owed 10,000 denarii and he forgave. The story, in the purpose of that one was very different from today. Even though there was someone who owed someone and the debts were forgiven, in the first time, that was to show Peter that we should give continuously. This one is not about us forgiving. It's about something more special. So, there's a creditor, and he tells the story that there are two debtors. Why does he talk about two? Remember in Matthew 18, he said, oh, someone owed the, the owner one, you know, 10,000 denarii. But here he's mentioning two debtors. Why does he mention the two? One owed a little, 50, and one owed 500, so that the Pharisee would realize that everyone had a debt. We are all debtors. And I believe you guys confess that a lot when you say, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors in the Our Father prayer over and over. You guys say it multiple times a day. I'm a debtor, right? Now, to give you an idea, one owes, five, um, one owes 500 denarii and one owes 50. What is 500 denarii like? Well, if they got paid one denarii a day of work, six days a week because they took the Sabbath off, that was about 82 weeks of salary. Almost just under two years. So that's like, in today's world, that's like what? Anywhere from two to $500,000 forgiven. And the other 50 denarii, which is maybe, you know, 25, you know, 50 days of work, which is almost two months salary. So someone is given, forgiven almost like four to $500,000 and someone is forgiven $50,000. Neither of them is that small. One is much bigger and one is smaller. But everyone in the story has a debt. And you want to know what it says? He says, and when they had nothing with which to repay. That's probably something that we forget. It doesn't say that they, they had a partial payment and they were, if they had a partial payment, guess what could have, they could have done? They could have renegotiated the terms. They could have done a refi, 15 years. The rates are great, wonderful. Okay, let's just do a refi. They could have negotiated something. But the creditor says they had nothing. That's very important for us to understand. That even though we have many debts, there's absolutely nothing you could do to repay those those which deeds we have done voluntarily and involuntarily, knowingly and unknowingly, secretly and manifest. 
What could you do if you want to say, okay, I'm going to pay back what I owe God. You, by the way, do you know the consequences of sin? What does the Bible tell us? The wages of sin is, is death. What, what do you have to repay that debt? You tell me. The problem is that we forget that we absolutely have nothing to repay God back. The debt should have consequences. In the first parable, Matthew 18, what happened? When the person didn't pay their debt, they were beaten and imprisoned, right? They were put in prison. And we know that the consequences of sin is, is death. So we have nothing with which to repay. The consequences have to be put on us. They have to be imposed on us. We're supposed to die. We're supposed to go to hell forever. And we forget that so much in our daily lives that every little sin, it doesn't say which sin causes death. It actually says the wages of sin, any sin. You might think your sins are not the kind that deserve death because you haven't killed anyone this week. But every sin is worthy of death. The beautiful part is they had nothing with which to repay. So then it says the creditor did what? He freely forgave them both. And that is something that we oftentimes forget about God's forgiveness. This freely forgiving. And it says free, but I'm going to tell you, tell you that it wasn't totally free. That's what the story is about. It's about the one who forgives. And the Bible in the Old Testament says, as far as the east is from the west, he removes our sins from us. Many people have this feeling like God wants to punish us, that he's a judge and he wants to, we're going to go to hell. He really wants us. He's like, actually, our God in this story, he's not wanting the consequences. He doesn't want you to go through the consequences. He has a desire for restoration and reconciliation and transformation. He wants you to become new people. It says in the Bible, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus Christ says, don't fear. He wants to give you the kingdom. He wants to forgive you. Many of us have this thing in our lives where we're like, I'm not sure that I could be forgiven. To put this in a little bit of a modern day terms, I heard this story, and I don't know if you've heard it. I've said it years ago, but I love it. There was a young boy and his dad. They lived in the Midwest. They had a very big yard. They had an apple orchard. It was a huge yard, and it was so big that the train of the town would run through their yard every day at a certain time. This little boy loved his dad. He did everything like his dad. He walked like his dad. He talked like his dad. He laughed like his dad, and he wanted to be like his dad when he was young. But when he was a teenager things changed. For those of you who have teenagers, you may know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, he got in a fight with his dad, and he argued with his dad, and he called his dad something horrible. He says, I don't want to be here anymore, and he left, and he turned his back on his dad, and he ran away. When he finally got to where he was going at the hotel, he realized what he did was wrong. So he says, I don't know. My dad will take me back. So I'm going to call him. So he called him the next morning and said, Dad, or he called him that night and said, Dad, I'm so sorry of what I did. I realize that you may not want me back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ride the train through the yard tomorrow. If you want me back, tie one handkerchief to one branch and I will come home. If I don't see it, I'm going to go through and you'll never see me again. And he hung up before the dad could say anything. So then the boy got up early the next morning and he's on the train and he is so nervous. And he gets on the train and across from him is sitting an old man and they're talking and he's telling him his story. And then he started to notice that he's getting near the village, the town where they were. Things are looking familiar and he's getting a little bit more anxious. He says, oh no, uh, we're getting to our house. I can't look, I can't look, you look. So the old man looks and he starts crying. And the boy says, I knew he didn't want me back. I knew he didn't want me back. And the old man says, no, you look. So the boy looked and turned and he saw that on every single branch of every single tree in the orchard, there was a white handkerchief. 
the boy got the message. You see, that's freely forgiving. That's what our Father is for us. He freely forgives. Same thing with our kids who mess up over and over. But we need to understand you have absolutely nothing with which to repay, and he freely forgave them both. Now, this idea of forgiving, I think we take it too lightly. Let me ask you this. Is it easier for you to donate $100 or $1,000 or to forgive someone who wronged you? Is it easier for you to give or to forgive? Someone who gave you a bad look, someone who said something, who maybe didn't return something, someone who broke something of yours or who just wasn't kind to you, and you're like, oh, forget them. Let me ask. We, we have a lot of trouble forgiving. And we almost always want justice or revenge or karma on that person that didn't do something nice to us or did something not so good. It's hard to forgive. Would you agree? Many of us would say it's very hard to forgive. Let me ask you, would you rather ask someone to give you something or forgive you something? Because asking someone to forgive you requires a lot of humility. It requires shame. It requires admitting that you are wrong. And especially if you're asking someone to forgive you for something that you've done over and over. And in the end, you were the one who turned away and you want them to forgive you. This woman, the sinner woman, loved this parable. So then Christ goes to the Pharisee and said, of the two, which one loved him more? He says, I suppose the one whom was forgiven more. A lot of us have this very shallow relationship with God. I don't feel that close to God. But yet, you come to the services regularly, you attend this meeting, and you guys are probably going to want to bring the speaker coffee every week, I understand. But that's the way. You don't, you don't have to do that. Um, you guys... You, you're used to that, but a lot of times you feel, I don't really feel close to God. That love is missing. And then here's this woman who lives her life as a sinner. And yet here she is throwing herself at him. What was the difference in the two? The one who loved more realized the value of the forgiveness. Oftentimes we might think our sins are like the 50 denarii or... Let's put it in today's terms. We think it's just a few pennies. I, okay, I did something. Psh, God probably doesn't even remember it. He, and we think our sins are so cheap. And I'll tell you, our sins are not cheap because each one, the value of it is death. And then this forgiveness. I'm going to skip a few slides here. I'm, I want to read you two quotes. Uh, I love these quotes. The woman loved so much that she gave this very expensive oil. And to some it seemed wasteful. But love, to be real, it must cost. It must hurt. It must empty us of self. This is Mother Teresa. It's actually a beautiful, I mean, this is actually what the woman did, right? But this is actually what Christ did too, right? It says he became like man. He emptied himself. He was one with the Father, but he emptied himself. It cost him a lot. And uh, it hurt. It's kind of like the prodigal son's father. This is that kind of, that kind of love. It's, it seems almost wasteful. Here's this boy who takes everything you have. He leaves you. He doesn't want to be near you. He totally loses it in the worst kind of way. And he comes back and you, you give him a cow? You give him a fatted calf? You give him a party? You give him new clothes? You give him shoes and a ring? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it kind of goes along for this, this quote that St. Mother Teresa says. 
Intense love does not measure, it just gives. So we're thinking God has loved us. Have we loved him? This love that does not measure, it just gives. This is exactly like Tata's love. This is Tata's love. And I experience this all the time when I visit my parents. So I will go with my wife and two kids. So we're a total of four. We're going to eat. And what does she make? She killed the fatted calf and maybe the neighbor's fatted calf and this whole spread. And I was like, wait, it's, there's four. Who is this for? She's like, I didn't, I didn't really measure. I know that, but I couldn't stop giving. I just need, you're all that I have. I just give. Actually, isn't that what God does? I mean, we don't deserve anything that we have, but you know, he just keeps giving. What kind of response is Christ praising? The one that is full of love, the one who realizes how much they've been forgiven. If we realize what gift we've been forgiven, it is the most amazing thing that you have. It's the difference of hell and heaven. It is the most precious thing. Our response should be like what? Should it be like the Pharisee with a cold heart doing the basics, coming to these services? Or should it be like that? One that doesn't measure, it just gives. One that is willing to empty itself. One that costs, one that it hurts. It's okay to do that for God because you know what? He did that for you. That's his love for us. And that's what true love really is. You want to have a true loving relationship? Respond. Respond. This whole parable happens at a meal with God like where we just came from 10 minutes ago. That meal, you are not an intruder. You're actually invited, even though we might be the outcast. He knows what manner of men and women we are. He knows that we don't deserve to be there, but you know what? He's willing to pay the cost. He's willing to allow it to hurt to let you come and join him at the meal. What should our response be when we come to the liturgy? God, you gave us so much. Then Abuna says, um, dispose of our lives as you see fit. When he prays that, what should you say? Take me. I'm yours. Whatever you want. You've given me you. And now I want to give you me. This is the response of a Christian to God. And you say, well, how do I give to God? You give to God by giving to others. You show love to his children. The greatest thing that you could do for anyone on the planet, and you guys would probably agree, if you take care of someone's kids. If someone takes care of your kids well, you will love them forever. Christ says, you want to empty yourself, you want to just give, you want to just hurt, hurt for my children. This parable is a a credible parable. It's not about forgiving. It's about you loving God because how much he has forgiven you. I want you to remember that your sins are not cheap. His forgiveness is not cheap. His love doesn't measure and neither should ours. Let's respond to his forgiveness. May God be glorified in our lives now and forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for each and every one of us personally, I thank you, dear Lord, that you never decided that you've given too much. You've always decided that you've never given enough. I thank you, dear Lord. I thank you, dear Lord, for loving us so much, even though you know what manner of men and women we are. You still draw us. You don't refuse us, even though we're not feeling that same desperation as the woman. I pray, dear Lord, that you would convict us. Give us the same desperation that she had. Dear Lord, I know that she planned to buy the flask, but the tears were natural. Help us, O Lord, to realize the beauty of what you've done. Let the tears of our repentance pour forth. 
I pray, dear Lord, as you changed her, you had also changed us. As you forgave us, help us, O Lord, to learn to forgive others. As you loved us, help us, O Lord, to learn to love you and to love others. I thank you for your kindness and your mercy and your great blessings. Through the intercession of our beloved St. Mary and all the women who washed her feet and all those who offered you an act of love, hear us as we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.